Great, thank you. I, I want to thank John Nolan uh, for inviting me to this meeting. Uh, this is an unusual venue for me. I usually talk about anti-VEGF medicines uh, because I helped develop it, and I'll tell you the history of all that. I also want to compliment uh, the, a previous speaker. He was, he's talking about a, a very politically charged topic. In, in my field, um, uh, it's very controversial, and that's why I was so happy that I wasn't uh, charged with that talk, because uh, you could only put your foot in your mouth. Uh, if you want to get grants, you can't talk against zinc. So enough said. Um, I'm a little bit different. Uh, I am uh, financially very, very involved in this, in this situation. Um, I'm a consultant for, uh, gosh, a, a lot of companies. Um, uh, uh, the ones that are really important for my talk, at least, is going to be Regeneron, Allergan. I'm, I'm helping develop their, um, their DARPEN program. Novartis, I'm helping develop their ESPEC program. Alphatec, I'm helping develop their uh, anti-PDGF drug. Um, uh, Bayer, I'm helping develop their regorafenib eye drop. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that, but oh, yeah, I guess so. Um, uh, uh, Genentech, I'm helping develop lampolizumab. Okay, so uh, I also, uh, uh, I, I invented a, a molecule called sRNA. Uh, it, uh, the mo molecule I invented was called bevacirinib. And uh, right now it's being licensed by a company uh, that I can't consult for or do any clinical trials for in Massachusetts. I'm not gonna mention them because uh, that's licensed through the company that I founded called Opco. Uh, so I am, uh, I'm also in faculty though at University of Central Florida, which uh, allows me to have all these relationships which is unusual for most uh, academics. Now, I started studying macular degeneration when I was in grade school. Reason was, was my father was a professor at Harvard Medical School in retina. He was the partner of a guy named Charles Skeppens, who developed the indirect ophthalmoscope. So dinner conversations, when I had dinner with my dad, was talking about diabetic retinopathy and macular degeneration, because that's the only thing we had in common. <laughs> so when I think of macular degeneration, I think of it from the eyes of a child, a seven-year-old. And what my dad explained to me was that, you know what? I go, what is this macular degeneration stuff? Why do you, why do you have to go to surgery 36, day, you know, 36 times in, in a week uh, to fix people's eyes? You know, this was a seventh grader. This was back in the 70s. He wrote the first book on vitrectomy. And he was doing lots of vitrectomies back in the 70s. And he said, well, you know what? Macular degeneration really is, uh, uh, you know, it's, you have a lot of bumps in the back of the eye. I go, okay, what, what are bumps? Well, there's two types of bumps. One is the dry bump, which is called drusen. I, I didn't know what drusen was, but I, I'm not German. So, you know, uh, so, so he just said, well, there are bumps in the back of the eye. So I go, well, how do bumps in the back of the eye cause problems? And he said, well, you can also develop blisters in the eye, like this, like a blister. And this is how he explained it to me when I was a child. Blisters like, a fluid blister or a blood blister? If you get a blood blister, it's really, really bad. And then, you know, after dinner, he would say, when you grow up, you'll solve that problem. I know that. And I said, geez, that's, that's a big, big deal for a seven-year-old. You know, I'm going to solve the problem of blindness. And, 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 and unfortunately, that stuck with me. It's like, a, like you know, the, you have the, the angel and the devil on the shoulders. So I have my dad going, you got to cure blindness. You got to cure blindness. You know, he's always on, on the back. And so that's why I started on this whole uh, journey that I, I call it. Now, in the dinner conversation, we had this conversation about something called factor X. Now, there's a lot of factor Xs. Uh, factor X in cancer, factor X in, in arthritis, the factor X in, 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 in macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy. Um, this factor X was a factor which caused blood vessels to grow in the back of the eye, and it had all these, these criteria. It was soluble, it was a potent vascular permeability factor, a potent vascular mitogen, it was also sufficient to produce findings of diabetic retinopathy and exudative AMD, and if you inhibited it, you would reduce all that and you would cure blindness. This is the conversation I had in dinner. Usually it was Sunday dinner because that's the only time I ate dinner with my dad. What we eventually found out, and uh, this, this is a story that I started you know, back in 1989, right? Um, actually, uh, back in 1993, I met Paul Bernstein, who's right there. He was, he was the retina fellow, and I was a research fellow in a, a lab at, at Harvard uh, called Judah Folkman's lab. And what we, what we found was that this molecule called VEGF, uh, which is, uh, it was discovered actually as the, uh, uh, it was a molecule in the, the, the liver fluid of uh, acidic patients who had liver cancer. It was uh, discovered by Harold Dvorak in his lab, 
where he actually uh, isolated the protein from acidic fluid. This, this is back in 1982, I believe. Then what happened was he thought he called it vascular permeability factor. Then in 1989, Napoleon Ferrara, and uh, there were several groups that, that found it. I'm not going to name all the groups. Uh, it's been a long time. Um, they found out that it was also a very potent vascular mitogen. And Napoleon Ferrara in Genentech, who was working at, at UCSF, he was a postdoc in, in, in a lab in UCSF, uh, decided that this was the same molecule that Herod Dvorak found in the liver of cities. As a result, what happened was we then saw a molecule that had several of the characteristics of factor X. It was a vascular permeability factor. It was also a vascular mitogen. Then the next thing we had to find out was, it, was it soluble? We also were working with a guy named Napoleon Ferrara, who was at Genentech, who was able to clone it and produce the molecule. That was a, that was a coup, right? We had all the things to do the right experiments to show that VEGF was factor X. Now, VEGF works with two receptors, VEGF receptor 2. It binds, and it, it, it goes through uh, 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 tyrosine kinase uh, pathways to ca cause angiogenesis and vascular leakage. Also downstream of this, this activation is NF-kappa B. And NF-kappa B binds uh, zinc. And so that's why that was the science behind the concept of using zinc at that time. And that's, that was a, sort of a, an inside concept that we were bantering about when, we were, when AREDS was being developed uh, with Joanna Seddon and, and that group. So that was a concept that, I, I guess, I don't know. We, we knew that it, would, it could be a good anti-angiogenic. And that's why it was used, right? Now, is it? No. But you know, that's, another, that's, another, that's another talk. Now, what I set out to do back in 1993, when I, 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 was, I, I got to Harvard and um, I was working in, in Judah Folkman's lab, was we set out to prove that VEGF could produce all the findings of diabetic retinopathy or macular generation. So um, I got the purified molecule, VEGF, from, uh, from California. And I injected it into normal eyes of non-human primates. And I produced uh, pretty much all the findings. And this is sort of my, my, my sort of work for, the, for my first like, four years or so you know, working on this uh, back in the 90s. Um, actually, in Arvo, in 1995, there were five papers on VEGF. Five papers. I was on three of them. And the two others were also from my lab. So we really introduced the concept of VEGF back, back in the 90s. Now, What's interesting is that when you inject VEGF in a dose-dependent manner, you can produce uh, the findings of microaneurysms. You can produce uh, neovascular glaucoma, uh, iris neovascularization, uh, macular edema, uh, neovascularization of the disc, and also um, uh, pre-retinal neovascularization, which defines all of the findings of diabetic retinopathy. We also then subsequently uh, injected under the retina and found that it could produce choroidal neovascularization as well. Okay? I, I have some slides of that, but uh, it's, it's too much. It's just all background. The big coup was when we worked with Napoleon Ferrara to, uh, with a molecule called A461. A461 is now called Avastin. How many people here have heard of Avastin? Okay. So my job was to purify Avastin, which was designed for cancer, okay? so that I could inject it into the eye so I could do my experiment. You know how long it took me to purify that molecule? Six months. Six months of constant uh, you know, uh, titrations, et cetera. It was very frustrating, because when I injected it into a, 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 a normal eye, it would cause endophthalmitis. Why? Because recombinant proteins carry a lot of endotoxin. So I worked with Napoleon Ferrara using columns to purify Avastin, or A461, so that it was purified to the point where I could inject it into the eye and do this experiment, which was one of the seminal experiments to show that inhibiting VEGF could actually uh, stop uh, this, this model of, of branch retinal vein occlusion. Well, fast forward to 2005, and bevacizumab is approved for the treatment of colon cancer. The one mistake that uh, Napoleon did was he used the, f the purified formulation and used all my assays to purify the cancer molecule to the extent that it could be injected into the eye. Well, a person that was sitting across from me in the lab, so I was in the Howe lab at Mass Eye Near, and then uh, in a, a, a Ted Dryges lab was a guy named Phil Rosenfeld, who is uh, now at the University of Miami, and uh, he was uh, very involved in the clinical trials for Lacentis and, and, uh, and, and at that time, Macogen. And he said, well, 
uh, he had shown that I had purified this molecule so it could be used uh, in an eye. And so he decided to inject a human just by drawing it out from the cancer drug. And he, he showed this. This is one of his first slides where he demonstrated a reduction uh, after injecting a vastin of, uh, uh, of the, uh, actually, it's a vascular permeability. And now, uh, as they say, that's history, right? But all along, we were developing Lacentis and uh, ILEA and uh, Macogen, and, and now we're developing uh, more anti-VEGF drugs. Well, there is a problem. You know how you mentioned that, uh, that uh, people didn't predict uh, geographic atrophy. I, I, I predicted that back, back in 2001. Um, uh, there was work done by Pat DeMore uh, in the Skepens lab, and she showed that uh, VEGF is a survival factor for neurons, and actually had several models where she could cause sort of a glaucoma-type picture by injecting anti-VEGF therapies. So I knew it was limited, but the FDA in the United States only requires a two-year study, so we couldn't see it, right? So, uh, you know, while this was all great and all, and I felt very proud that I helped develop this whole technology, I wasn't very happy because it was going to cause problems. I knew it in the future. Now, right now, the current standard is, uh, is this. Uh, we inject a vast and ILEA. Right now, it's really a vast and ILEA at this stage uh, because of cost. And we're injecting lots and lots of patients. I mean, our clinics are like this. So I'm a vitriol surgeon. I inject 35 patients a day. I see 60 patients in a day. And uh, that's five days a week, sometimes six days a week. Right? Just do the numbers. How much is that? Okay, just myself. I have five partners who do the same. Actually, they do more than I do because I do some research. Think about that. Think about the, the magnitude of that issue, that problem. And that is what convinced me uh, to try to figure out how to reduce this burden. And that's what led me, actually it was Paul, Paul and, and, and John who, uh, who led me to this uh, idea or this concept of using carotenoids as a way of reducing the burden of uh, injections. Now, just like I did for VEGF, you've got to understand the pathogenesis. And what we found, uh, you also have to figure out how to stop the VEGF stimulus. And I'll, I'll go over this in the, in the slides of how the thought process of why it led me to this meeting, right? And why am I presenting actually in this meeting? So one of the papers that we did uh, was by, uh, by Masa Kuroki, who is uh, one of our Japanese postdocs. Uh, that, that was uh, uh, lent, lent to our lab for two years. Masu was great. He, he, he was a great golfer, for sure. And what he did was he showed that uh, reactive oxygen intermediates, uh, or ROSs, or superoxides, uh, could produce uh, upregulation profoundly of VEGF. And that was a very, very critical finding. But look at the, look at the date. This was back in 1996, before anybody thought about VEGF as anything. So this paper is lost in the archives. It's actually in JCI, so no ophthalmologist has ever read it. It led us to the concept of what causes the VEGF upregulation in VEGF. In diabetes, it's ischemia. It's also something called AGEs. But in AMD, we don't have any of that. But we know it's a very oxidative process. As a result, uh, we, we realized that free radicals or, or superoxides could increase VEGF. So what in the AMD disease would increase free radicals? Very simple. I mean, um, you have high energy visible light, uh, A2E, uh, also lipid peroxidation, protein peroxidation, and ischemia reperfusion. Those are probably some of the main factors that result in, I, I also left out one, it's probably the complement system. So a lot of the complement factors actually can upregulate VEGF, especially downstream complement factors. And so uh, all the stuff you were talking about with CFH uh, being aggregated is actually propagating this. I, I don't know how it's a kind of a balance issue. I haven't really thought that through very well. Now, so AG, most, most people here know about the visual cycle. I mean, Paul, Paul Bernstein is actually, uh, wasn't it, Paul, in your MIT thesis, you, you, you figured out all these, all these molecules? Yeah. The guy's smart. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, no, no, well, well, think about it. Uh, the, uh, the tour, somebody told me that, that Cambridge was only second to MIT. And I think that's, Paul, Paul that's where you did your, your research, right? Uh, in terms of, of ranking or something like that for, for prestige. Um, well, A2E is a bad molecule. We found out by Janet Sparrow's work that actually it, it was, caught, was, 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 was this lipofusin that we find in autofluorescence. 
And we found that that actually is very indicative of the progression of AMD, wet AMD in particular, and also geographic atrophy. Now, A2E is a bad molecule because if you shine blue light on it, blue light is the light that you see here in all these, uh, no, no, the LEDs. So like this is blue light. Uh, um, any of the LED lights or computer screens, et cetera, that has a lot and lot of blue light. If you shine blue light on A2E, it actually causes an increase in free radical production. And, 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 and that, that, is, that is, well, think of the optical system as a funneling of all the blue light. So why do you think we get macular degeneration? Because that gets the most exposure of blue light because it's focused by our lens, right into the macula. So it's a concentrated light that then uh, gloms with A2E, causing a tremendous amount of free radical production. So this is the AMD pathogenesis that I've sort of been working with. You know, again, I, I started working on this when I was like sort of seventh grade, so I do a lot of block pictures. You know, I, I use le very little graphs because I'm a simplistic guy. And so what we, what we see here is that there are three pathways to increase in free radicals. Visual cycle, light, causing free radicals, increased VEGF. ARMS is a, is a mutation that results in an impaired antioxidation. Uh, so low macular pigment, also worked by many people in this room, have demonstrated that that causes increase in free radicals. Also through the innate immune system, uh, drusen uh, have a conglomerate a lot of macrophages, which then also produce a lot of free radicals and also produce a lot of VEGF in general. So this is the whole pathway. Now I am working on this pathway here right now with several, several uh, innate um, uh, immunity molecules that can inhibit the pathway, uh, also macrophage manipulators. Uh, uh, that's with, with uh, uh, biotech companies, uh, because this is very hard to, to, to manipulate. This innate immune system is very hard to manipulate. Um, but we have ways of stopping both of these. How is that? One is to stop blue using blue absorbing lenses, which is what I'm wearing right now, to block the blue light from getting my bacula. I don't care if it comes from the side. When it comes to my macula, I don't want it, OK? The next thing is, well, low macular pigment is, uh, macular pigment is, uh, from what I learned from the esteemed colleagues here in this room, is actually the best way to uh, block blue light and also to uh, add antioxidation. I knew zinc was not an antioxidant, but macular pigment is. And so what you got to do is you got to increase macular pigment. Now, this is, this is, I came about this uh, when I, was, I, I heard a lecture from Paul in the AAO in Chicago back in 2010. He presented this paper, which demonstrated uh, uh, the singlet oxygen uh, quenching of the different carotenoids. What really struck me, and I don't know if it struck anybody else in the room, because I remember, I don't know if you remember that, Paul, but I, I approached you after that, your talk, and I said, hey, Paul, you got, you got to tell me about this, uh, is that he demonstrated that the combination of meso, zinc, no, meso, zeaxanthin, zeaxanthin, and lutein would actually quench more than any of those individuals. He also showed that meso, zeaxanthin was the critical or the, the best of the singular carotenoids to inhibit. That's what started me on this journey. That's why I'm here four years after, or five years afterwards, actually. And, and then John Nolan's work, I mean, you know, the work was coming fast and furious from this guy in Ireland. I didn't even know who John Nolan was. You know? <laughs> you know, seriously, he didn't do anything with VEGF, so how do I know him? But he was doing all this work showing that meso, uh, when you looked at macular pigment, like you compared it to uh, lutein, lutein did not uh, increase the macular pigment okay, alone, but meso did. And then uh, Dr. Landrum and Dr. Bone, I'm not sure, I, I think they were here. Uh, again, I, I read their work. And they showed that the distribution of these carotenoids was so critical. In essence, what I found was the VEGF for prevention, or the anti-VEGF for prevention. Why? Because we already had an innate way of protecting our maculas, macular pigment. And we also found out that if we could upregulate that pigment, guess what? You have now developed a sink. What? Did you ever ask yourself this question? Why, if we have the genetic mutation in macular generation, do we develop it only when we get older, right? Oxidation process requires time. It also requires a reduction in this, and that's what we have when we get older. Again, a lot of the people who work in this room, it's not my work, it's your work, but I'm just interpreting it, that's all. Now, hypothesis. Restoring macular pigment can reduce free radicals in macula and reduce stimulus for VEGF upregulation. 
So I had three questions. Can LMZ or MZL, whatever, whatever you want to call it, supplements prevent need for injections in exudative AMD? Can it potentiate anti-VEGF injections in exudative AMD? And can uh, these supplements also uh, uh, re reduce uh, DME? So I'm going to show you cases, and th this is where I'm going to end. Um, caveat, this is not a study. I'm involved in 16 clinical trials right now. And if I was going to call this a study, I'd have to get IRB approval. I don't want to get IRB approval. It's too much of a hassle, and I have no grants for this. Okay? So this is not a study. So I'm presenting not a study. This is clinical observation. Caveat. MZL prevents need for injections in exudative AMD. My first patient, a UK gentleman. Okay? Um, he, I, I, I see patients in the villages. It's the largest retirement community in the world. It has 115,000 over 55. Right? They drive around in golf carts. That's how they get around. It's around 1,000 acres, and they're all old. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not old, but you know, I'm, I'm old, but you know, they're all elderly. This guy was visiting his girlfriend, uh, who was in the villages, from the UK. And he developed metamorphopsia, and he's also had a prior history of family history of exudative AMD. He comes in, and you guys have a national health service here that doesn't pay for care in the United States. So he was my first patient, because ethically, I would have had to inject this guy. He, was, he had a small, classic uh, uh, parafoveal lesion, and uh, he had some retinal fluid, which would indicate that I would have to give him an injection of Avastin. But he didn't want to pay for it, because I guess in the UK, you don't pay for those kind of things, right? <laughs> right so, so he said no. And he said, well, so why don't you try uh, this? Uh, it's called uh, mesozeaxanthin. It's macro shield. Oh, yeah, I know macro shield. So he tried it. And what happened was that um, uh, after three months of, 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 of MACU Health, which is what it's called in the United States, um, it didn't progress. It actually reduced. His vision kind of improved, and his symptoms went away. Now, I'm going to show you, this is 30 months now. I see him once every four months now, OK? And uh, he hasn't needed an injection, and he's still seeing fine. OK, next case. OK, I'm yellow. Um, this, is the, this, is the, this is sort of the summary. Another one, uh, another patient, this is uh, my, one of my typical patients, had subretinal fluid, uh, had sort of some leakage, some ooze. Um, again, uh, I was going to try to get her into clinical trial, but her vision was too good, 2030. So I could, do, I could do this, and I was waiting for her to get worse so that I could put her in a clinical trial. I don't know that that, that makes any sense, but that's how it works in, in the United States. Uh, after taking it, well, she couldn't get into my clinical trial because her vision improved, and she got rid of the subretinal fluid. Um, now, this is... Uh, just, uh, just recently, this was May 2015, so I'm here, so I'm not seeing her. <laughs> Hello, bummer. But my guess, my guess is that my, 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 my partners will have injected her already. Trust me, they will. <laughs> um, another case, 73-year-old drusenoid PED, okay? Six months on Mac Health, the drusenoid PED goes away. Now, this is not really classic wet. This is a drusenoid PED. We don't know what to call that. It's an RP detachment. But in six months with, uh, with Mac Health, it's gone. Second, can anti-VEGF injections in exudative AMD uh, potentiate? Can it, it, can it add benefit to my injections? And I'm going to show you my, my first case. Uh, this is a case of a baseline. I've been seeing this patient since 2012. And I, 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 you know, I wasn't giving them a, a, any, any supplements at that time. What I did was I was injecting them with uh, initially Avastin. Uh, so I started on Avastin. And then um, I, I then started, uh, ALEA came about, and then I started on ALEA probably in 2014, or around 2014 or so. Um, um, I, I, I got compassionate use uh, because uh, I, I, helped, I, was in the, I was one of the bigger recruiters for the ALEA clinical trials, so they allowed me to, to use it on, on, on certain patients. And um, uh, it, it, didn't, it didn't really work. Uh, it, it didn't reduce anything. It didn't do anything. It just kept on getting worse. Unfortunately, insurance came about. I had to switch him back to Avastin. And this guy progressed rapidly. So you can see his vision 2050 to 2100. As soon as I switched him to Avastin, I couldn't switch him back to ILEA because uh, his insurance wouldn't pay for it. So as a result, uh, it kept on getting worse. So as a last ditch effort, I, I started him on uh, twice a day MacuHealth. Now look at this date, 317, 2015. John Nolan gave a talk in my, my, my meeting in Aspen, Colorado. And that's why uh, uh, I started him on two times a day because of what we talked about in dinner. And look what happened. After this, 2160 to 2050, I gave him an Avastin injection, but, and, and the PED, you can, you can see it's still there, right? 
but it's much less, much smaller. The subretinal sub fluid is also much less. Okay, here, it's almost, the subretinal fluid, uh, the PED is almost completely gone. Subretinal fluid is almost completely gone. And this, after three months of two times a day, they're 20, 40, and he notices the difference. That's pretty impressive. That's called potentiation of anti-VEGF therapies. Summary of case. Okay, I read. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to show you. Uh, I have only two more cases, and I'll, I'll, I'll rush through them. Okay, here's a patient, again, uh, uh, who has a PED, uh, menorphopsia, bang. Uh, uh, one injection, and then on, mac on mesozeaxanthine, and bam, it's gone. If you inject a lot of people, you don't see that. Okay? I actually never see that. Uh, my friend in, in BU did a study on these kind of PEDs and uh, using a Lucentis and found that only 12% responded after six, uh, six injections. 12% only responded. This responded after one injection, and it, it was maintained. Uh, again, 6.30, I just saw this patient, right? And so uh, you can see that, that on this, the vision is, is, is very good. Actually, this is, this is reverse. It's 2030 down here and then 2040 up there. Uh, DME, this is the last slide, so I'm almost done. Um, again, I only started using uh, this on DME patients. So I don't have many cases. I have now maybe four or five cases where um, this is a patient that, I, again, 2030 doesn't make my, my clinical trials. I'm in five clinical trials for DME right now, okay? So I should be able to get them into the trial, but the vision is not bad enough. So I, I put them on this, and you can see there's already a reduction. I've been in over 20 phase one clinical trials. This is a signal in all of them, okay? I mean, and, and, and I, I've gotten th uh, six drugs through registration. So I know what I, of what I speak. Conclusion, sorry. Uh, MZL demonstrates biological effects in terms of reducing subretinal fluid in both AMD and diabetic macular edema. Further studies are needed and can be performed without FDA guidance, which is great, because I work with the FDA, and I've been audited by them like three times, so I hate that. It's awful. Similar to VAST and MZAA can be a lower cost means of reducing injection burden. Thank you very much. I don't know if time, I don't have time to. Thank you. It definitely asks for another trial, this uh, observations, I guess, but there are some questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, hello. Do you know if HIF1 alpha is involved in this upregulation of uh, VGF? Um, uh, not the free radical. No, free radicals, they do, it, it's, it's transcriptional and RNA stabilization. Uh, uh, HIF1 alpha is upstream of, uh, of that. So it's not involved in this. In diabetic retinopathy, it is. So HIF1 alpha is not doing anything it, it, right it, here. It, 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 it's, it's not the classic pathway. So okay, it's another. for diabetic retinopathy, vein occlusions, HIF1 alpha is classic. And yeah, what, because? Uh, because it's, it's the hypoxia, hypoxia way, but free radicals work through a different, different mechanism okay, of upregulating Free radicals digest. also uh, induce HIF-1 alpha, so it's, it's not here doing anything. Yeah, but okay. we, we haven't seen, I mean, uh, okay. I've, I've talked to a lot of people. Uh, I, I, I have a, I designed an SRNA for uh, HIF-1 alpha, uh -huh. um, and I have the patent for it. So, uh, I, of course, I, I've looked into it, and it, it, that's why I haven't looked at it in AMD. We're, we're thinking of looking at it uh, in, um, in, in diabetic retinopathy, though. Okay, thank you. Yeah. In one of your examples, you, uh, in one of your examples, you pointed out that you use two Macchia Health per day. What criteria do you base using two as opposed to the normal dose of one? Um, uh, John s showed me data that said that two increased it faster. Um, I, I think that was your most trial. I, 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 I only pre you presented it in the meeting, and it was very quick. So. But, and then we talked about it. That's why. And you have to take it, you, have, you, said, you told me, you told me, you have to take it separate, right? So, uh, like, uh, uh, separated by time, so you, you, because you can't absorb it. Oh. <laughs> Where's Steve? <laughs> oh, he's not here. Okay, sorry. Sorry, Steve. <laughs> I, 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 you know, you were in and out of my meeting, too. <laughs> so, you know, I... <laughs> So we're, we're simplistic clinicians. Yeah. We do dose response curves. That's what we do, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's exactly. So I guess I, I can understand why Stephen was the one that told, told us to do that. <laughs> 
the very back. Uh, yeah. yeah, Michael, thank you for your talk. Uh, can you comment on the zinc controversy? I know being in North America, there's a, a big burden that we have right now as a clinician, whether to recommend zinc, what amount of zinc, uh, to do genetic testing, to not, I mean, there's legal. Well, I, I, I can't. I was the, the number two recruiter for the AREDS 2 study, and um, I, I, can't, I can't talk about that. Sorry. Paul. Cool. Okay. Yeah, I was a little surprised on some of your results in terms of the speed of, you know, in the early uh, speed of response. That earlier I was talks too. That, yeah, earlier talks that we've had here where it's looking very carefully at how the macular pigment responds, that, that you're, seeing res you're seeing effects that w are unexpectedly fast. Very so, unexpected. Very so, unexpected. Yeah, we need to really look at this a little Caveat. More. I remember yeah. I told you, this is not an IRB-approved study, and, um, well, I, nobody's going to fund this study. Right. I mean, I, I applied to the NIH, but the, it, it's not about air so, yeah. you know, I'm not going to get funding. And I would say the other thing to be careful on, at least in my practice, where, the pa where patients are nutritionally aware, I'm not sure how it is in Florida. They're not um, nutritionally aware. Okay, yeah, because in my practice, everyone has a sky-high macular pigment. Even I know by that. By the time they come in with wet AMD, they're already See, Utah's you know, already a great saturated. place, but, you know, Florida, yeah. we're the, the obesity capital of the United States. <laughs> we have a lot of uh, uh, these all-you-can-eat buffet places. Yeah. No greens. No greens at all. <laughs> okay. Great. Other, any other questions? Thank you. Final one. Thank you very much. Um, you had inflammation up there as one of the key pathways, and I wonder if you have any information on whether anti-inflammatories reduce the incidence or how No, it's the innate immune system. So you have to manipulate macrophages. So the, the, the biggest strategy right now that we're using, and I'm, I'm working with several uh, companies, um, biotech companies, where we manipulate the pathway of macrophages. And that's the way you can control the innate immune system the best. If you, you switch uh, the pathway of the, M, the macrophages from M1, M2 to what we call the, the regulatory macrophage, um, you can use Pentraxin 5. That will do it. It's, being, it's a drug being used in uh, myelofibrosis. And I'm working closely with that company. I, I don't know if I put it up there, though. So. Right, thank you. Okay, let's thank the speakers again.